What drives a person to become a serial killer? Today we delve into the dark and twisted minds of four notorious serial killers from Kenya. Serial killers, a term that sends chills down the spine. These individuals are not born overnight, but rather, they're the product of a complex interplay of personal, societal, and psychological factors. Their actions, as horrifying as they may be, often stem from deep-rooted issues that have been battered and bruised over time. Today, we attempt to unravel the enigma that is the making of a serial killer, peeling back the layers of their lives, their crimes, and their motivations. Our journey takes us to Kenya, a country that has seen its fair share of terror at the hands of these cold-blooded murderers. We delve into the lives of four individuals who have made headlines for their heinous acts, each with a unique and chilling story to tell. First, we have John Matara, a man who used the anonymity of dating sites to target his victims. Next, we explore the case of Philip Onyancha, a man who claimed to kill under the influence of a cult. Then, we examine the life of Caroline Kangogo, a police officer turned killer. Finally, we venture into the dark world of Jeffrey Niroj Mathery, a man so twisted he earned the nickname the Naivasha Vampire. Each of these individuals has left a permanent stain on the fabric of society, their actions serving as a chilling reminder of the darkness that can lurk within the human psyche. As we delve into their stories, we aim to shed light on the conditions and circumstances that could lead an individual down such a horrifying path. Let's explore the chilling stories of John Matara, Philip Onyancha, Caroline Kangogo, and Jeffrey Niroj Matheri. Our first case study is John Matara, a man who used dating sites to lure his victims. The story of John Matara is one that chills the bone, a tale of manipulation, violence, and an abuse of trust. Matara, as we understand it, was a predator lurking in the shadows of online dating platforms. His hunting ground was the web, and his prey, unsuspecting women looking for companionship. The case of Starlet Wahoo puts a face to Matara's victims. Wahoo and Matara were last seen together entering a lift in the Pepino apartment block. Later, Wahoo was found lifeless in an Airbnb, and Matara was apprehended at a hospital, nursing a self-inflicted stab wound a chilling end to a date that began online. But Starlet Wahoo was not Matara's only victim. As news of her murder spread, more victims came forward, sharing their harrowing encounters with Matara. Their stories paint a picture of a man who not only stole hearts, but also assaulted, tortured, and robbed his victims. The allegations against Matara are as numerous as they are horrifying. What's more troubling is the suspicion that Matara was not acting alone. Police believe he was part of a larger criminal ring, specifically targeting women on dating sites. This adds another layer of complexity to Matara's case, suggesting a network of predators operating in the shadows of the internet. Despite the mounting evidence and the increasing number of victims coming forward, the police were slow to act. This lethargy allowed Matara's reign of terror to continue unchecked, leaving his victims to suffer in silence. With the police slow to act, Matara's reign of terror continued unchecked. So I met this guy on a dating site. Uh, we exchanged numbers and we met on a particular day in a certain Airbnb. The guy seemed nice from when he picked me from the Uber all the way to the house. Everything was so nice till midnight. The guy decided to beat me up and ask for money. Did bad things to me, was using a knife and an iron box to threaten me to give him his, my phone passwords and then pesa pin and accounts. So after everything was done, I gave him everything, he checked my account and saw the amount of money I had. So he decided to like, ask me to transfer it to him. I did everything he asked. I, I can testify that. Even when I transferred money, it came John Ongoa Matara. It's the same number that I saw people complain and post online, even the DCI post that today. Our next case is Philip Onyancha, who confessed to murdering 17 people in the name of a cult. Philip Onyancha a name that sent shivers down the spine of many Kenyans in 2010. This self-confessed serial killer confessed to a killing spree that was as chilling as it was bizarre. He claimed to have been recruited into a cult by a teacher who instructed him to kill 100 people and drink their blood as part of a twisted rite for good fortune. Onyancha's victims were mostly women, and his modus operandi was as grisly as the premise of his crimes. He admitted to kidnapping children, murdering prostitutes, and leading police on a macabre tour of the country, showing them the locations where he committed his heinous acts. 
For the Kenyan police, Onyancha was a paradox. His confessions, if true, solved numerous unresolved murder cases, but they were so outlandish and horrific they seemed almost unbelievable. The teacher he claimed had indoctrinated him into the cult was missing, adding another layer of mystery to the case. The public reaction to Onyancha's claims was mixed. While some saw him as a monster who needed to be locked away forever, others were skeptical. They questioned whether his confessions were genuine or if they were just a convenient way for the police to close unresolved cases. Despite the skepticism, the fact remained that Onyancha confessed to 17 murders. His confessions, whether born out of cult indoctrination or a disturbed mind, brought an end to a reign of terror that had gripped the nation. Despite doubts, Onyancha's confessions have provided closure for some unresolved murder cases. Caroline Kangogo, a police officer turned killer, is our third case study. Kangogo's story is a chilling testament to how anyone, even those sworn to protect us, can become entangled in a web of crime and violence. Born and raised in Kenya, Kangogo joined the National Police Service over a decade ago. Over the years, she served in various police stations, earning a reputation as a sharpshooter and a team player. Her colleagues saw her as a jovial officer, always ready to lend a hand. By 2015, her hard work and dedication were recognized, and she was promoted to the rank of corporal. But beneath this commendable facade, a darker story was brewing. In 2019, Kangogo faced an indisciplined case for negligence at work, a stark contrast to the diligent officer she once was. However, what truly shocked the nation were the accusations that followed. Kangogo became a prime suspect in the murders of two men, a revelation that left her colleagues and the public in disbelief. A woman who was once tasked with upholding the law was now on the run, evading the very justice she was supposed to enforce. Detectives in Nakuru, a city in Kenya, made a public plea for Kangogo to surrender. Yet this plea seemed to fall on deaf ears, as Kangogo's whereabouts remained unknown. A cloud of fear hung over the country as citizens wondered where the rogue officer could be hiding. Once a respected officer, Kangogo's turn to crime has left many in shock and fear. Her story is a stark reminder that the path to becoming a serial killer can be walked by anyone, regardless of their profession or status in society. Our final case study is Jeffrey Nyoroga Matheri, also known as Fongo, a self-confessed killer with a horrifying modus operandi. This man, unlike your typical villain, hid in plain sight in the quiet town of Naivasha, Kenya, but his actions were anything but ordinary. Matheri's reign of terror began in 2008, his targets unsuspecting women. His methods were cruel, brutal, and downright inhuman. He would kidnap these innocents, subjecting them to unimaginable torture. But it wasn't just the physical pain he inflicted that made his crimes so shocking. Matheri had a chilling ritual, one that would earn him a place in the annals of Kenya's most notorious criminals. He would drain the blood of his victims and then, in an act of pure horror, he would drink it in front of them. It was this macabre ritual that led to his eerie moniker, the Naivasha Vampire. Witnesses who testified in his case painted a gruesome picture of the scene they discovered. A school uniform, a mattress, a mug stained with blood. Tangible reminders of the terror these women had endured. In Matheri's house, they discovered a grave, a final resting place for one of his victims, her body bearing the marks of severe cuts and injuries. The news of Matheri's crime sent shockwaves across Kenya. The details were so horrific, so unprecedented, that they left the nation reeling. It was a stark reminder of the darkness that lurks within society, hidden beneath the veneer of normality. Matheri's gruesome acts earned him the nickname the Naivasha Vampire, a chilling testament to his crimes. His story serves as a grim example of the depths to which human depravity can sink and the monsters that can hide behind the masks of ordinary men. Each of these four serial killers from Kenya had their own unique and horrifying methods, but what links them all is their ability to strike fear into the hearts of their communities. John Matara, the dating site predator, used the guise of romance to lure his victims, while Philip Onyancha, the cult killer, claimed that his gruesome killings were part of a blood-drinking ritual for good fortune. Caroline Kangogo, the killer cop, used her position of power and trust to commit her heinous acts. And Jeffrey Nyoroj Matheri, the Naivasha vampire, 
instilled terror with his blood-drinking habit and brutal tortures. Each of these individuals had different backgrounds and motivations, yet they all took the same dark path, leaving trails of devastation in their wake. Understanding what drives a person to become a serial killer is an ongoing challenge for criminologists and psychologists alike. But one thing is clear. The impact of these individuals on their victims and their communities is devastating and long-lasting.